You're now listening to the Tax Smart REI Podcast, the number one tax podcast for real estate investors. Hey, do you have an LLC or are you planning to start one? If so, the 2024 Corporate Transparency Act requires you to file a beneficial owner report within 90 days of forming your LLC if it was created after January 1st, 2024 or by January 1st, 2025 if it was created before. Failure to comply comes with stiff penalties of up to $500 per day plus potential criminal charges and no, we're not making this up. In this masterclass, we'll guide you through each step simplifying the BOI reporting process so you can relax knowing you comply. Join us on March 19th at 12 p.m. Eastern and take care of your BOI reports now before it's too late. You can secure your seat by going to www.taxsmartinvestors.com slash masterclass and join for only $27. This masterclass will literally pay for itself in less than one day of non-compliance. Plus, the replay will be available for future reference. Again, you can join this masterclass by going to www.taxsmartinvestors.com slash masterclass. And for our Tax Smart Insiders, this is included in your membership. So go ahead and check Circle for your registration link. We'll see you there. But for now, we'll dive right into today's episode. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. For our listeners who may not be familiar with your story, could you give us a brief overview of your background and how you got involved in real estate? Sure thing. We'll do, guys. And again, appreciate you having me here, Thomas and Ryan. Excited to spend some time with you today. So I'll try to keep it somewhat short and concise, but I, you know, I always I joke and say that I, I'm one of the lucky ones in that I've never had a real job. You know, I went to school, attended bar in the evenings while going to school and uh didn't know exactly what I, what, what I wanted to do when I grew up, but um, I got lucky during that time frame, and I met a uh, an individual by the name of David, and David happened to be a, a local real estate investor uh, in my hometown in, in, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where I was born and raised. I won't go into the nitty gritty of like, you know, ultimately how that all came about, but what occurred is that I got to know David over a period of time, and I got to see that his lifestyle was very different than mine growing up. I, I never went without, you know, grew up in a, you know, a, a dual working household, went on one family vacation a year. Again, it's all relative that I didn't know that we didn't have certain things and it was good, right? Life was good. So I didn't grow up poor or anything like that. But um, I will say that David had a very different lifestyle than what I was used to growing up. Just uh, had a lot, seemed to have a lot of flexibility in his life. He was always around, you know, and so he dated my girlfriend's mother at the times, how I got to know him. But uh, he always seemed to be, pop around like during the week when other adults should be working, right? Like that was the yeah. first thing I noticed. And uh, to me, that just meant... He had a good bit of flexibility, which was unique. I just, I didn't know that existed. And so anyway, long story short, I ended up working for David for about a year and a half for free while I was going to school, attending bar in the evenings. And um, he was about 25 years older than me. And I saw some some challenges he had in his business. He was a solopreneur. He had done really well, but he had challenges with technology and, and a few other areas. And so I just, I saw that he was doing something special. I enjoyed being around him. And so I just offered my my services, whatever they were going to be. And, and ultimately they were at a little bit of everything. It ended up being about 14 months just so I could learn the ropes and understand just the basics, right? The high level points of what it was he did and how I could potentially replicate it and actually you know, start doing something adult-like with my life, right? Because I was at a point where I was like, what am I going to do? Um, and so that's what happened. I When I was uh, almost just nearing 21 years of age, I bought my first uh, rental property. You know, Fast forward to today, I mean, that was back in 2000. And so, you know, I've been doing this now for more than two decades. Um, I've owned hundreds of single family homes, hundreds of apartment units, lots of different commercial real estate, every type of commercial real estate you can think of from traditional office, to medical office, self-storage, you know, neighborhood retail, the list goes on and on. But back in 2011, I was introduced to mobile home parks. And uh, that's one of the two asset classes that we focus in today. So bought my first mobile home park back in 2011 and uh, you know bought the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. And then ultimately back in 2016, formally put together what is known as Sunrise Capital Investors, which is our, our investment arm that we operate under today. And uh, we own uh, mobile home park assets in, in 13 different states. And also in the past five years, I've added another asset class to our, our vertical offering, which is parking, uh, you know, parking lots and parking garages. And so I've done a little bit of everything over the last 20 plus years, but today, 99% of our time is focused in mobile home parks and parking assets. That's awesome. I'm really excited to dive into both of those areas. I think both are exciting asset classes and we know we have a lot of questions around some of that. But before we kind of transition into those assets specifically, you've been doing this for over 20 years now. You've invested in a lot of different asset classes, uh, single family apartments. Why transition to mobile home parks and parking lots at this point in time? It's a great question. And uh, the best way to answer is by just backing up a little bit. So the one little segment of, of my story, which is a big part of it all, is what ultimately occurred in 2008 during the, the financial crisis that, that we all encountered. And so I, I lived down in Florida at the time. Um, 
I basically stayed in Pennsylvania for two years and I moved down here and I, that's where I, I'm at today, Tampa Bay area, and uh, have built my business over the past 20 years. But ultimately, Florida was really ground zero back during the uh, financial crisis of 2008. And so I found myself in a very challenging situation with uh, with a few hundred single family homes and, and a few hundred multifamily rentals. But leading even leading up to that point in time, you know, before the, the financial meltdown occurred, what I did notice is that there were some major inefficiencies in my single family rental portfolio. And again, I, I don't like reinventing the wheel, right? Like I don't like fixing something that isn't broken. I think I mentioned that to you guys when we started recording this, right? Like I, I use Zoom for my podcast. You guys use Riverside, right? I've been using Zoom for years. There's probably a better option out there. I just, I don't like fixing what isn't broken right away, right? And, and however, Looking back, there was inefficiencies with my single family portfolio from a management perspective. We were spread out amongst like five different counties. And this is back before there was lots of different technologies that exist today to, you know, create those efficiencies within the uh, the property management side of the business. And it just ran me ragged. And ultimately, that's what really pushed me to start looking for a better way. And, and, and multifamily was that, right? So I started buying multifamily back in like 2005. And then again, you know, 2008 occurred and it really put the brakes on things and really had a fairly significant impact across my portfolio. But the, the part of the portfolio that really suffered was my single family stuff. And uh, anyway, long story short, there was about a three year hiatus where it was just more, more damage control, just trying to manage, you know, what I had and, and trying to, you know, to weather the storm. And I knew that after that three year kind of hiatus of just really playing damage control, I, I knew that I wanted to get back into being proactive and stop looking, you know, in the rear view mirror, but let's start looking forward and like, what, what does this look like to rebuild? And so I went on like this little journey because I really had, I, I, I would remove myself from the day to day and just really focused on, again, just trying to deal with all the, you know, the swords that were being thrown at me left and right on a daily basis. And so I didn't really pay attention, like what were others doing that were still out there investing, right? Like, you know, the, the landscape had changed quite a bit. And as I went on this exploratory journey of just finding out like, what's next, you know, what's next in this world of mine to rebuild. And I had this, uh, I had this lunch meeting that a friend of mine lined up for me with this gentleman by the name of Randy. Randy was a banker, commercial banker down here in Florida. And my buddy was like, Hey, just go hang out with Randy. Randy's a cool dude. You should know him. You know, he's a retired banker and, um, he's just a nice guy, right? Like he might be able to, you know, your net worth is your network. Right. And so it was kind of like meet him. He knows a lot of people. So I had lunch with Randy and Randy just, we're just shooting the shit and getting to know each other. And he's like, you know what, what's your story? What are you up to? And then once I told him that, he's like, well, what's, what's the plan moving forward? I'm like, I don't know. That's why I'm kind of here. Like we're just you know, trying to figure out what's the next step. And, uh, and at that point I, I thought that multifamily, traditional multifamily was going to be the way again, like that was kind of like where I, where I ended things and kind of determined that I wasn't going to do single family anymore. And that multifamily was the more efficient and better way to do things to, to you know, kind of regrow this, um, this empire. Yeah. And that's when he quickly, you know, said, Hey, have you ever considered mobile home parks? I'm like, I, that the funny thing is like, that's the one asset class I had never even considered. I had already owned some industrial retail office, but like mobile home parks, never considered it. He's like, well, let me give you the, the bullet points. And he kind of ran through like the reasons why he loved it. And he's like, I think you should it's a sort of multifamily. He's like, but there's a lot more benefits associated with it than what currently exists in the multifamily space. Um, we can go into those maybe if you guys want to, but long story short, I left that meeting so excited. I was like, I think this is it. I'm going to go learn as much as I can about this, this world of mobile home parks. I'm going to go buy one. I'm going to go buy one and either, you know, either prove that Randy was right or prove that Randy was wrong about how great they are. And that was it. I mean, so that was 2000, that was 2010 when I actually met, had lunch with him. And in 2011, I bought my first mobile home park up in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, literally owned it up until like two years ago and uh, bought that first one. It went well, I bought the second, bought the third, bought the fourth, and just really built a system out of it and fell in love with the asset class. And here we are today. Good. That was a very long-winded answer to your original question of why mobile home parks. So that's, that's how I was introduced to the space and have since fallen in love with the asset class. And it's, it's continued just to outperform year after year and has been a, just an incredible part of our portfolio. That was an amazing story, an amazing journey to how kind of the trials and tribulations of being a real estate investor and ultimately, you know, identifying the asset class that, you know, that suits you best, you know, at your stage in your journey. I definitely want to dive into mobile home parks, but before we dive right into mobile home parks, kind of unpack kind of the investment benefits of investing in mobile home parks. I would like to kind of go through a little bit of parking lots because this is an asset class we've not really explored here too much on the show. I know we have a lot of investors out there who are interested in this specific asset class. So how does the parking lot game work? Is it like a value add play or is it a cash flow play or is it like a mix of both? 
I mean, it could, it could be all the above, right? And I, and I think that that answer also applies to pretty much any other asset class, right? Like there's, there's surely pick multifamily, pick mobile home parks, pick, you know, you name it, right? Like there's core assets that are stabilized property and, and, and just, you know, phenomenal market, you know, maybe downtown urban core markets. Uh, and then there's, you know, maybe some more distressed plays, maybe some secondary tertiary type markets, uh, maybe some assets that are becoming functionally obsolete. You know, there's some value, value out of play there. So like it's, it's all relative as well in the, in the parking lot sector. And so, but I mean, we're value add investors. So like, that's kind of our core. And so we look at it from that perspective, you know, we're not just looking for stable five and a half percent returns, you know, uh, it's just that exists in plenty of other places. And so we, we want to, we want to see how do we grow value? How do we find, how do we identify the problem and how we, you know, find a, a solution for that problem. And that exists in anything that we buy and the same exists in parking, right? Like there's, horrible operators, there's decent operators, and there's great operators. So we try to find really good assets that are owned and operated by the horrible or the even just the good operators, because we know that we can typically do it a lot better than they can. And so um, I guess case in point, I'll give you a good example of, uh, of an asset that well, we purchased. It was a couple of years ago. It's been about two and a half years, but uh, this is a surface parking lot and it's in downtown uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. So really good market um, corner, you know, corner lot, you know, it's a lighted intersection and um, it's a small lot though. It's 20, I think it's 28 parking spaces. It's pretty small, right? I mean, it's tiny. We bought it from a mom and pop owner that literally was, was operating it for a number of years. He, he let his son kind of run the show. His son collected, his son didn't even take credit cards. He just collected cash. Um, and in, as you guys know, in today's world, like, we're almost a cashless society, right? And so like, and honestly, like I wouldn't have been on park there because I very rarely ever carry cash on me. So anyway, like it just, it wasn't being run efficiently. Their parking rates weren't dynamic. So they weren't adjusting their parking rates with, you know, the busy times, you know, Friday, Saturday nights, events, concerts, things like that, like that, that happened in that downtown area that happened commonly in that downtown area. They were just kind of like, it's this much an hour or this much flat rate for the day and that's it. Right. And, um, and they didn't have good enforcement in place. So like when people would steal parking from them, you know, the son would leave work at five o'clock on Friday and he wouldn't come back till maybe one o'clock on Saturday. Right. And people would like leave their cars overnight and there was no, no systems in place. Anyway, long story short, we negotiated this property based on what their, you know, existing financials were. And, uh, we, we essentially pay like a five cap, um, based on actuals. But I knew I'd already done due diligence. I knew the market uh, and I understood the dynamics of the market. I knew that we could easily double, if not triple the top line revenue in a very short period of time. And so on that, in that scenario, we actually, I, I put it out the bid to a couple of local operators. And um, what I was really looking for is like a long-term lease. I wanted them to come and just literally do a triple net lease. And, um, and so just to give you some, some numbers, when we bought it, the NOI, uh, the year that we purchased it, or the prior year, full year NOI, was $38,000 and we paid $695,000 for it. And literally before we even closed on it, I had a triple net lease in place at $72,000 a year with 5% increases on an annual basis. Um, had, literally had it in place, triple net in place before we even closed on the asset. Fast forward a little bit. So that's great. That's a basically almost a 10% unlevered return, right? Like that's a, that, that was, that was great value add. We saw the opportunity, knew how to execute on it. I've gotten to actually know the parking operator quite well that leases this property from us. And, you know, the year after we bought it, so he knew even more than we did to a certain degree. Like they managed, you know, 15 other parking lots in that downtown area. They got some economies of scale. This parking lot on average does about $120,000 a year of top line revenue. So, um, yeah, but they're managing dynamic pricing. They know all the events. They reserve parking. The setting. So, like, they bring value for what you know for what it is they do. Like their infrastructure, we don't have that, right? But we knew how to identify the value and extract it, and then let someone else take over. You know, the day to day, and that is for the most part a hands off operation. They're not all like that, but that one is. It's, it's truly is just hands off, and it's just asphalt. There's really nothing else to fix there. I mean, there's paint some of the curb stops. It's got a you know, it's got an iron fence around it with like a gate. Other than that, it's um, it's about as simple as they come. So I'm not going to say that there's a million of those out there just like that, but I guarantee there's, you only need how many, right? Like it depends on what your goals are, right? You might only need one or yeah. two of those to quit your job, you know, live whatever lifestyle you're looking to live. So uh, anyway, that's an example. And uh, I don't think it's an extreme example either. I think there's a lot of other assets out there just like that. So, so just out of curiosity on these assets, or at least the ones that you invest in, like, what do you see the common returns being on that from a, say, a cash on cash or an internal rate of return perspective? Yeah. So on that one, so we actually didn't even put debt on it until 
I guess it's probably been about a year and a half now. And I don't remember the exact returns. And obviously rates were a little higher, but even then it didn't, didn't make it. I think the, I think the price were like 1.2. So we basically got all the investors cash out with really low loan to value on it. And so I guess you could say that it's an infinite cash on cash return. I mean, really, if you want to, I can answer it in that manner, because we truly got all the investors cash back on that deal on the refinance. And so it's a, it's a very high cash on cash return, but let's not use that as an example. Let's use a, a normal scenario, or I guess a more normalized scenario. So we I used another case study of a, of a deal we did that was a value add parking asset. It's a parking garage that we actually own in our backyard. It's down in Clearwater Beach, Florida, obviously very popular tourist destination, one of the you know, top beaches in the country. And we bought this asset. It was a public-private partnership. So half of it was owned by the city. The other half was owned by a private developer that actually built the asset roughly seven years ago. And um, municipalities just are not the best business people, generally speaking. So they made some bad decisions with pricing. You know, they always tried to keep it lower than the market for whatever reason, but they never took into consideration how much money they had into the investment. So the thing never actually produced any positive cash flow for them. They never got an ROI on their initial investment. On top of that, they had a challenge partnership with the developer. They didn't agree on things. The developer is very entrepreneurial. They wanted to make changes, push prices, this, that, and the other city didn't want to. Anyway, so we came in and we essentially bought both aspects of the of this 702 space parking garage right on Clearwater Beach. So what we noticed immediately, like we just did the parking rates, you know, they were on average charging three bucks an hour and they had no adjustments for like weekends, 4th of July, all, all these crazy weekends that happened down the beaches, right? Spring break, they were charging three bucks an hour and literally just the average on-street parking in the local vicinity and all Colorado Beach on average was six bucks an hour. And that didn't take into account like, you know, these you know, weekends uh, when it fills up or on just all summer long, essentially, like when it's uh, the peak of the summer traffic and, and the tourism traffic. So we literally, we did the same thing there. We worked with a couple of, not, we knew where the upside was, but we wanted to bring an operator in that wanted to lease the entirety of the structure from us. So we paid 30, roughly $34 million all into it. We brought a third party operator in that, you know, we gave them what was a win-win lease. It was a, a good lease rate for them. They knew they had some upside still to, to, to achieve. And for us on the going in acquisition based on the, and we only put, I think 50% debt in place on it. Um, ended up being like a seven and a half cap ended up being, you know, roughly like a 9% cash on cash return, give or take. But the beautiful part about this is literally two months after we closed on it, we got a third party appraisal done from Collier's based on this new lease that we put in place. And we paid 34, um, it's triple net. They take care of everything. And it appraised for just shy of $50 million. That was like $48.7 wow. million. And, and so what the operator did right when he went in, literally the only, his biggest value add was what we already knew he was going to do. He went in, put in new parking equipment, doubled the basic hourly rate from $3 to $6. Right. And it didn't, it, it didn't adjust the amount of traffic coming in because people, when they're down at the beach, there's only, there's limited parking. In fact, a lot of the parking lots are going away. A lot of the surface lots are turning into high rises and they're not building additional parking. They're building how much parking they need for the unit and they're not building excess. And so the parking sh supply is shrinking. So like when you got a screaming baby in the back seat of your car and you're coming down and spending the day at the beach and you're driving around, like, are you going to try to drive around 20 more times to find something for, you know, $4 an hour when you could just pay six bucks an hour, $20 flat rate or $25 flat? No, you're going to, you're going to park there. It's a parking garage, your car shaded, the set. So anyway, that's what they did. They came in, they adjusted prices accordingly and they achieved some upside on top of what our lease is. But like we made our money, we made our value out of play. And again, it just was identifying the problem. The problem was the city, just they're horrible businessmen. They make bad decisions through and through. And so we saw an opportunity to capitalize on a you know, incredibly well-located asset in an irreplaceable location that had just huge demand. And the demand was being met by the facility, but the prices weren't according to market. Hey, are you tired of working with generalist CPAs that tell you you can't use the real estate professional status, the short-term rental loophole, or cost segregation studies, or worse, have no idea what these things are? If so, it's time to elevate your game and work with a CPA firm that gets it. Here at Whole CPA, we've worked with thousands of investors, helping them save millions of dollars in taxes through proactive tax strategy and planning, tax preparation, and outsourced accounting solutions. So if you're ready to elevate your game, make tax filing painless, and save thousands of dollars in taxes, what are you waiting for? Head on over to www.therealestatecpa.com slash become-client and request an initial consultation today. We are accepting clients for the 2023 and 2024 tax years. So if you're looking for a change, you have nothing to lose. Just head on over to www.therealestatecpa.com slash become dash client, fill out the form. We look forward to hearing more about your situation and how we can help. But for now, we'll dive right back into today's episode. I guess like every other asset class, there's a lot of opportunity in the parking lot space. 
One thing I did want to touch on before we kind of move into the next topic is it sounds like the tax benefits to these have also got to be pretty good, right? So for example, on your asphalt parking lot, that's all got to be land improvements. I, I have to presume eligible on for hundreds. Asphalt, spec. yes. On just the service parking lot, yes. Uh, parking garage is not nearly as as attractive from a tax benefit as like a mobile home park. Mobile home parks, I think, take the cake as being probably the most tax efficient yeah. commercial asset class that exists. I, I do believe. Love to be challenged on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we know mobile home parks we'll dive into in a few minutes. I, I know they have some of the highest depreciation um, allocations that you can find you know, in terms of real estate. The last question on parking lots for now, say I'm an investor, I'm looking at different asset classes. Why parking lots versus any other asset class that I could get involved with? Yeah, I mean, again, there, there's a, a million and one different ways to make money in real estate. So I'm a firm believer that there's not one asset class that's better than another per se. They all have their pros and cons. I mean, I, I can argue why these two asset classes, why we love them, why we think they're hugely beneficial and they offer you know some of the best risk adjusted returns, blah, blah, blah. But like you could probably find a similar argument on the other side of the table, right? Like it's just some of it comes down to personal opinion. There's a lot of factual data to support it as well. But with all that being said, we view parking lots. And again, we look at way more parking lots than we buy. And so like, I don't feel and what we've seen in the last five years, we've been buying, there's not as much opportunity as there might be like, you know, buying mobile home parks. And I, I can explain what I mean by that. But long story short, we look at parking lots in the strategic locations that we purchase them. We look at their current state as a parking asset as the lowest use as it sits today, meaning that like it's in a prime location, the economics work today as a parking lot, and inevitably it's essentially going to be a, a cash flowing covered land play until which time it's got a higher and better use, whether that be a, a mixed use project, you name it, whatever it's going to be at a later date. And so we know that the underlying land value supports the investment thesis. And so like to us, it just makes sense. And on top of that, there's a lot of other factors involved here. Number one, a lot of municipalities across the country, you know, like 70% of the large major cities as well, have removed any parking lot minimum requirements for new developments. And so like, you know, new high rise developers, new hotel developers that come into a downtown area, whereas they used to have to build a certain amount of parking per thousand square feet, like that was just, it was built into the code. They had to build it, even if they didn't need it, they had to build it. And so, you know, back in like the eighties and nineties and two thousands, you found a lot of excess parking that wasn't being utilized. A lot of those parking minimums have been removed over the last decade. And so developers that they don't have to build, they'll build only enough parking. They make much higher of a return on building a condo unit or a hotel unit or what have you. And they're building just the minimum parking. So parking supply is actually shrinking in a lot of these areas. And it's, it's a beautiful thing for us, right? Like we've got a prime location. We know that cars aren't going away tomorrow. It's going to be quite some time. Even when autonomous right, vehicles right. take over the world, they still need a place to go. And, right. and like I said, we look at it as like, the lowest use is its present time as a parking asset. And if the economics work and, and they work in a strong way, then we can make a ton of sense operating as a parking asset, cash flow, cover land play for the next decade, two decades, until whichever time it's got a higher and better use as a redevelopment project. So that's kind of how we look at it. It's like it's almost like a no lose endeavor. It's it'd be very difficult to to ever lose, with at least how we look at them and how we buy them. Right. Would you also say like you find both of these assets classes to be a little bit more recession proof, right? You've kind of got your story that you explained and it's like, Hey, I kind of stuck going through the 2008 crash and all of that. And it's like, Hey, let's get into something that maybe is a little bit more right, recession proof. It's not mm -hmm. like recession bulletproof. <laughs> there's, there's still an impact uh, on these asset classes, but would you agree with that? I, I feel like I've heard that in the yeah. past. And is that part of your asset investment play? Absolutely. I mean, speaking of parking lots, like one other important factor, and I can you know, give kind of the reasons for, for mobile home parks being recession resistant, but how we look at parking assets, they got to have five unique demand drivers associated with them. So it can't just be like this office building, they use 80% of this parking lot. And then the other 20% is like transient or, you know, maybe people visiting the area, uh, a hotel across the street, whatever. Like that's danger zone. That's like, in fact, a lot of the stuff we look at, it's associated largely with a office or a couple office buildings. And we just know like that, that's just not a space that you want to be in right now. Right. And you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket either, you know, no matter what. And so we want to see five unique, relatively even keeled demand drivers. So like, you know, government is one courthouse, you know, something along those lines, entertainment, like concerts, sports venues, bars and restaurants. And then, you know, office can be in there, but it's got to be a very small contingent of the overall parking demand drivers. And so if you got that, that wide variety of demand drivers, I'm not going to say it's like absolute recession resistant because look, COVID hit, thank God, like everything we own were in cities that, you know, just 
gosh, even Clearwater Beach actually thrived. It actually did better during COVID, uh, that parking asset, than, uh, than, than even pre-COVID. We own stuff in downtown Phoenix, Arizona, kind of the same thing, right? Like there was a little bit of a blip, but like we own things in markets that still seem to rebound fairly quickly. But there was a lot of other parking owners and still today literally own in cities that never came back. And maybe it was because it was associated with an office building that just never got the workers back in, right? But like they're dying on the vine, they're hurting. And so anyway, I do believe it's recession resistant. It would take another black swan event to really cause a blip on what it is we buy in the parking sector. But again, um, there surely would be impacts felt if another COVID or something like that were to hit the, uh, the sector. As far as mobile home parks, I mean, we all know the the affordable housing crisis that we have in the country and it, mobile home parks truly are kind of the, the last frontier of like affordable housing. Like they offer a really quality product. And I'm not talking like, you know, old 1950s beat up rust buckets. I'm talking like you know, the, the new modern mobile homes that are built today literally are built almost to the same specs as your traditional stick built home. Um, a lot of the same quality finishes on the inside, drywall, led lighting, you know, uh, different types of, you know, you know, whether it's Corian or, or, or quartz countertops, things like that, right? But it, it, it offers it at a, at a very affordable price. So I, I, you know, I like to say that we can go to anywhere. You can take any, any mobile home park we have throughout the country. Like I said, we're in like 13 states. And a lot of people just, they always try to compare a mobile home park or a mobile home in a mobile home park to like a, called a Class C apartment community. And I guarantee that, first off, most of our mobile homes are nicer than what you would get in a Class C apartment community. It's probably more akin to that of like a B minus, and and if they're brand new homes, it's probably more of like a B plus apartment community, right? But let's let's use the C class for the example. I guarantee that any city you pick where we own assets, you can live in one of our mobile homes for at least twenty percent cheaper, all in, than what you can live in that grimy Class C apartment complex that was built in 1970s and, uh, you know, it's got brown carpets and dark lighting and no wind, right? Like just not in the best part of town. And so like after the mobile homes, there's really not another option. There's nowhere cheaper to go. I mean, less under a bridge or cardboard box, right? Like there's really not a, che and it's not the worst of the options that are out there. So I think it's, it used to have a bad rep for a long time. And I think it's, the tides have really changed a lot over the last decade and the products, like the new homes that we're bringing into our communities, they're really, really nice. I mean, they are night and day what maybe they used to be or what people thought they were back when and offer something that's really nice at a very affordable rate. So for that reason, I mean, like just for that reason alone, you know, the recession resistant ability of that asset class, I think is it's real. It's not just like conjecture or just, you know, we're not just pulling data points out of the sky. Like it's real. Like it's back in 2008, there was some data and I forget which bank collected this data, but there were some statistics from like 08 to like, I think the middle of 2012, where they kind of like classified asset classes of which ones had the highest loan default rates and mobile home parks were the lowest of the entire batch across the board. So I think self-storage was next to that, but mobile home parks were the lowest across the board. So, I mean, that's just something in and of itself. Um, anyway, so I think they're incredibly recession resistant. <laughs> yeah. And Kevin, kind of, as we were talking about that, certainly like with any asset class, it comes down to the basic economics of supply and demand. And so mm -hmm. if we continue to keep the number of mobile home parks that are available or that continues to shrink, right? Maybe the zoning of it or so forth, or they're just not mm -hmm. like communities and whatnot aren't like, oh yes, let's go, you know, get new zoning for these mobile home parks, right? Unless that's, that's a misunderstanding. You could help just help me clarify. But at the end of the day, if we continue to keep the supply the same or it diminishes, then we've potentially got a higher demand issue, which right. kind of means that prices should theoretically, right? Basics economics 101, yep. prices should theoretically move upwards. And so it's, it's kind of like, do you, just your opinion, do you think that there will be an expansion as we continue to move towards kind of a more crisis here of, of this? We're so far away from an expansion even being possible in the mobile home park space. And a lot of it has to do with just the head buried in the sand of local municipalities, right? Like they, everyone cries that affordable housing is needed, but you know, going back to like the NIMBY syndrome, like not in my backyard, right? Like your residents and neighborhoods. And then you know, folks that are on the board of the local municipality, like they say they want something, here's a solution. But like, they just, again, they immediately throw mobile home parks into this one bucket of like drug, sex and rock and roll. Like we don't want that element next to our beautiful neighborhood, right? Whereas honestly, like a lot of the parks that were built in like the last 15 years, there's not a lot of them, but most of them were, their neighborhoods. I mean, we own a number of communities that while there's mobile homes in them, 
it's very akin to that of just a single family subdivision, you know, quarter acre lots with nice double wide mobile homes, two car garages on it. Like it just happens to be a manufactured home and not a stick built site built home. So I think it's just the, you know, the whole understanding and the vision skewed. Um, and so for that reason, I, I don't see any type, I, I mean, I see new developments being approved that maybe even 10 years ago, it wouldn't have been, you know, the time of day wouldn't have been given to that, but like, it is such a small, minute number. I mean, in the grand scale, like maybe 20 new communities get built on an annual basis. And, but there's way more than that, that actually get either to shut down or maybe, you know, bought out for redevelopment purposes and turned into something else. And so I, I just, I don't see the, at least the next decade where that is even a topic of conversation, um, expansion. Although I, I think it's the solution I do. And so like, from a business perspective, it's great if, if we never go through an expansion phase because like, again, the supply demand tends to work in our favor, but like for the purposes of providing a quality product that is needed here in the States, I mean, for folks to put a, you know, a roof over their head at an affordable rate, like it's an absolute necessity. I'd love to be a part of that solution. It's just, you know, uh, just got, again, folks with their heads stuck in the sand and don't want to see the truth when it's right in front of their face. So. Yeah. And thank you for that. One other thing I wanted to ask you on. As far as like your guys' bread and butter kind of value add to mobile home parks, like what is that? Is it simply like, hey, we just find X number of old units percentage and get rid of them and replace them with new ones? What's kind of your bread and butter play for kind of value add to mobile home park uh, communities? I mean, bread and butter, and, and again, it runs a gamut a little bit, but just bread and butter would be, you know, the market rents are slightly below what the market rate is. So like that's some easy upside. You know, maybe there's some... Uh, park owned homes that come with the acquisition. Maybe it's a hundred units, hundred space mobile home park, and there's 30 park owned homes in there. 15 of them are vacant. They're old, not worth really putting a ton of money back into them. We know that we can pull those out. We can bring new homes back in, kind of reset to the market rates on, on those 15 homes. Um, you know, maybe the park owner back when they build a lot of these communities, you know, water and sewer wasn't a high expense line item on the P and L. Today, it, it very much is. And so, you know, we'll, we'll identify a, a, a situation where this, the water and sewer and the trash has been included just because that's how they've always done it. Uh, we'll go put meters in each individual lot and then we'll bill back for the proportionate share of each resident's water and sewer usage. We can bill back the trash, you know, basically pro rata. So those are kind of like low hanging fruit. And then on some of the bigger value add stuff, well, aside from that, you know, some operational inefficiencies, like a lot of times we'll see like excessive payroll, you know, maybe it's like friends and family work in there, things like that. Um, and, I mean, we're just, we're buying a community right now. We'll close in like a week to where, I mean, literally the payroll is double what it should be. I mean, and, and we're not, we pay, like we, we pay in the upper, upper echelon of like, you know, uh, kind of what our pay scales are for like our community management and all that. Like our company pay, like, we're not like trying to find the cheapest labor possible. Like we, we, we pay a very, very fair price, but this one has got double the payroll. And so we know that we can easily cut that in half and find the same quality, if not better for half the price. And it, it's a family member that's in there right now, kind of run the show. So like, again, we can, we can change that very quickly. And then, you know, I mentioned bringing new homes and that's kind of, we, we view it as like, there's low hanging fruit, increased rents, medium hanging fruit, which is like changing some of those operational inefficiencies, billing back for water and sewer. And then the high hanging fruit, the hardest to get to, the, it's capital intensive, is bringing homes in. So bringing brand new homes in takes a lot of capital to do. It takes logistics to bring them in. It takes a, a marketing and sales team once you get them in there to get them sold. Um, that's kind of the the three broad spectrums of how we look at value add. And, uh, and typically every community we buy, the bread and butter ones, they have a little bit of each kind of layered in there. Before we move on from this, uh, I'm sure some of our listeners uh, are wondering if you compete with Brandon Turner at all. Do you compete with him? I know that he does, he does a lot of mobile home park stuff. Uh, yeah. Do you compete with him, work with him at all? I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, I mean, I know Brandon. Uh, I know my member back when he got into the space. I mean, we had many conversations. He's just asking general questions about the space. So Brandon's a good dude. Um, I mean, Brandon and I are like, we're one of thousands of people that own mobile home parks. And uh Neither one of his company or my company are even remotely close to being like in the top 10 of overall size of uh, owners and operators. And so, I mean, we're just, we're, I wouldn't say we're small fish in a big pond. We're probably like medium fish in a big pond, but you know, I wouldn't say that's, you know, I don't know an instance where we got beat out on like buying something that brands group bought and vice versa, but you never know, right? You never know who some of the other bidders are on some of these assets that we might be going after, but uh Outside of that, Brandon's a great dude. <laughs> yeah, you're the only two I know, so I thought yeah. I would ask. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, others I don't know if out you're there. Small. <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. and there's a. I mean, there's a number of publicly traded companies in our space. You know, so like sure. it's, it's there's a, a number of institutional investors that are you know in the mobile home park space. So definitely a lot of competition, but 
I think his business model is very similar to that of our own, of how we look at value add deals and how we execute on the opportunities. But right now, it's still a big enough sandbox to play in. You know, we're not trying to battle for, you know, there's 10 people battling for one deal. So, so I think I, we have t- two questions that are very similar that, I'll, that I'm going to ask in just one second. But before we do that, just want to, for all of our tax people out there, mobile homes, the reason why they're one of the most tax advantaged asset classes is because they're largely land improvements. Mm-hmm. And for that reason, you can use bonus depreciation to rapidly accelerate and increase your depreciation expense. So I just kind of wanted to throw it out there for all of, all of our tax people. Uh Kevin, if I'm an active investor looking to jump into the game today, what advice would you have for that active investor? Yeah, I mean, again, there's lots of similarities, you know, with mobile home parks to that of other type of, you know, real estate investments. As you're comfortable, I mean, if you're going to be active involved, you're you're comfortable with like the you know the day to day operations. Uh, know that that's it's not passive by any means. Like I think I think being self aware is important. You know, like just knowing that you're probably going to be in the trenches, you know, dealing with some bombs here and there um, until you can get some scale. I'd say some of the big red flags with parks, uh, a lot of these things were built back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. There was a variety of different types of materials used back then for infrastructure, some better quality than others, some that have stood the test of time better than others. And so some of the areas where I see folks completely lose it financially is by not diving deep enough to the due diligence, more specifically as it relates to the actual infrastructure component of it. So water lines, sewer lines, those are big ones. If there's private utilities like you know, wells on the property, um, wastewater treatment plants on the property, those are big big expenses. If, uh, if, if, it's, if it's not operating or there's, they're out of compliance or you got to do some major, major repairs right out of the gate, it could completely blow your budget for many years to come. Outside of that, you know, some of the other things just to take in consideration is if you're buying from like a mom and pop, you know, we bought a lot from professional operators as well as mom and pops. And it's like, it's like a night and day difference, you know, professional operators, they've got good solid books. A lot of times their financials are audited, you know, and even then, like we can pick apart some things and try to find some areas that, you know, just aren't exactly hundred percent accurate. But with that being said, most of the time, it's a lot easier uncovering some of the challenges, but mom and pop stuff, they, they keep a handwritten ledger, some of it's cash coming in for collections, some of it's checks, some of it makes it to the bank, some of it doesn't, you know, just really understanding who that tenant base is, do they pay on time and doing your best to actually underwrite that and, and know that when you're walking into this park and you think there's gonna be 40 paying residents that within a couple of months that you're not down automatically to 30, right? And then have 10 rehabs on your hand. And again, just blowing that budget for the first couple of years within the first six months. And I've seen it happen on many occasions. So it's just, it's really due diligence more than anything else, but it's applicable to any other asset class, right? Like understand what it is you're buying. Don't just think that like mobile home parks, like the common phrase I hear is like, oh, you're in mobile home parks. I heard they're cash cows. Like, well, they can be if you buy them right. <laughs> they can also be ca- you know, cash drags if you buy them wrong or if you buy the wrong park in the wrong market, right? And so um, just um, dot all your I's, cross over your T's and um, take a deep dive in due diligence. Hire necessary engineers, consultants if you have to. We do still. like We've seen pretty much everything, but we still hire licensed consultants and engineers on infrastructure. We send cameras down every sewer line that we're buying you know, right, to understand exactly what we're getting ourselves into. And that way there, there's no stone unturned. We've identified probably 98% of the things that might pop out after the closing, but there's still some unknowns there. But we try to get as many of those out of the way as possible before we close. So that would be my advice. Again, there's, there's a lot to learn, you know, active versus passive. It's just a completely different animal, right? Yeah, it takes right. a completely different person to like, I'd say more often than not, folks that say, I want to be active, get in. And there's a pretty large contingent of them that over time realize that like, this right. is, this was not made for me. And then the others thrive, right? But like the ones that are like, I don't know what percentage it is, but they're like, oh, okay, can I just give you money? Can I partner with you <laughs> and let right. you go do the, the hard work? Um, there's no right or wrong there, right? Like just, it's being self-aware of like who you are. You know, is, is family time important to you? Like, again, like there's a, there's a, just want to go out and buy one mobile home park. That's all you're going to buy. I don't know if that's a great decision. Cause like, it's going to detract from like anything else you're doing in your life at this point in time. But if the, if the goal is to say, I'm going to buy 10 parks, got to start with one. And I know once I get to 10, I'll be able to hire some, you know, some, some personnel to help me run the day to day and allow me to kind of remove myself from the, you know, the trenches. That's a better plan. That's a much better plan. That's an actual sustainable plan. The alternative where you just have one and you thought it was going to buy you more time with your family, the complete opposite typically happens. So that's fantastic advice. And my follow up question to that was going to be what would be your advice for passive investors at this point in time? Like, say, I, I joined the show. I love the idea of mobile home parks, parking lots, things like that, but I'm not going to go out and actively do that myself. I just want to provide the capital. 
what would be what would be your advice there? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think what that really comes down to is is finding you know the right group to to place your money with, right? Like the right sponsor that it's kind of like, you know, picking the right jockey in the horse race and taking time to actually study that jockey. Like what's their workout regimen? Like, you know, what's their history of winning? What's their history of losing? All that kind of stuff, right? Like you're really, you're placing a bet and you're putting your capital into what ultimately it's not just a partnership. I mean, there, it's part partnership, part marriage, right? I mean, cause, cause it could be pretty, pretty long term, you know, many years at that. And so just again, back to due diligence, right? different type of due diligence, but doing due diligence on the sponsor, the group, how long they've been doing it, you know, what challenges have they had? Go look at some of their assets, go visit the asset and person that, that you're considering investing in. If it's just, you know, a specific deal and break bread with these individuals, dig a little deeper, learn about their balance sheet, like how healthy of a, in a financial state are there, is their company? Are they personally, right? If they're the ones that are kind of like the backstop of the company, just be able to give yourself a comfort level by knowing that to your best of your ability, you've done your homework to align yourself with someone that is the right jockey that shares your investment philosophy, that's going to be a, a fiduciary of your capital and is going to be able to weather the storm, you know, if the waves kick up and it gets bumpy. So that's it. I'm, I think we're really great at what we do, but, you know, maybe we're not the best fit, but there's many other folks out there that are syndicators and, and offer passive investment opportunities. But I think that you need to talk to more than just one. Don't just listen to one podcast and make your decision. It's a big investment. It's a long investment. So take your time and, and choose wisely. That's excellent advice. The biggest thing in my view when you're investing passively is certainly picking the right group to invest with. Um, if our listeners wanted to learn more about you, what you have going on, what would be the best way for them to do so? Yeah, my website, personal website is kevinbuff.com. You know, I, I host a couple of different podcasts as well. You can find those there. If you'd like to see on the, on the company side, what we've got going on as far as, as investment offerings, just a little bit more about, we've got a number of case studies and prior webinars, things like that on our website. You can go over to sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. All right, awesome. We're gonna go ahead and drop that into the show notes for everybody who is interested in taking a deeper look at that. Uh, Kevin, want to thank you so much for taking the time to jump on the show with us today. Uh, before we wrap up, any final words before we call this one a wrap? No, I just appreciate what you guys do. Appreciate you having me on. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, I know how much work goes into putting on these podcasts and just, uh, you know, making it happen for all those that tune in and, and, and look for your advice. So just, you know, huge praise to you guys for what it is you do and uh, putting in the work. All right. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. All right. So we're back and we're going to do a debrief on this episode with Kevin. Ryan and I were talking after the show and we just wanted to clarify some of the tax benefits of investing in parking lots and mobile home parks. Because I know this is a tax podcast and everybody's always interested in that. So Ryan, what was your biggest thoughts You know, from a tax perspective? What do you think the listeners need to know? What's like the key items? Yeah, I think there was kind of three aspects that we talked about with Kevin. So just parking lots first. So I'll basically make it two different types of parking lots. You've got what he kind of called the surface parking lot, which is literally just land. And on top of that is asphalt, one level, one layer, no kind of structure. And what we would kind of expect is essentially all of that minus the land itself, right? You still got to allocate that, but the surface itself, essentially that's all 15 year land improvements. So that's all going to be bonus eligible, which is great. And that's why he's kind of saying it's, it's super tax advantageous. So they're probably doing a cost seg on those kind of assets. That's great. But then he also made a distinction, a separate type of parking lot investment could be kind of the parking garage. And so you're thinking right. of a parking garage, we've got essentially multiple levels instead of just the one kind of surface on the ground, we've got multiple layers, multiple levels. And so with that, he was kind of saying the structure, right? The ability to get to these multiple floors, that kind of main structure is going to be a 39 year property. So he was kind of saying it's not as advantageous as far as your purchase, especially if you're just going to acquire something that's already a parking garage. You've got a lot of that. That's going to be a 39 year property compared to just the surface, which is mostly 15 year property. Right. And then the last thing, and Tom, you can chime in after this, but the last thing, uh, the mobile home parks, right? He, he's totally correct. The cost segs that come from mobile home park investments, very, very, very high in 15 year property. Again, not like a hundred percent, but a significant amount of that acquisition is absolutely going to be 15 year property with maybe some 39 year property as well. So yeah. yeah. What, did, what did you think? Yeah, no, no. I think you hit the nail on the head on both of those. I know mobile home parks. I've seen a lot of cost segregation studies on those and have read you know, a tremendous amount of documentation on this. I've seen 70 to 75% of the mobile home park value being allocated in some cases to land improvements. 
So it is one of those asset classes that is great from a bonus depreciation perspective. I think the only other asset classes that come to mind that are from a real estate perspective, that are probably closer, perhaps even a little bit better is car washes and oil gas stations. And that's because they are, there's this carve out in the tax code that allows those entire structures, if they're designed correctly, to be eligible for bonus depreciation. So you might buy a car wash or a gas station and have almost the entire thing be bonus eligible, which is fantastic. But yeah, no doubt that mobile home parks are one of those. And one of the things I will say before we wrap up here about mobile home parks is, like Kevin was saying, from my understanding is cities, municipalities, governments, they do not want to build mobile home parks. And it's probably for the stigma that mobile home park, think about when you think of a mobile home park, the first thing you think about is a bunch of trailers in like a class D neighborhood that are just run down and you don't even want to go near it, right? That's kind of what most people think about. And that's the stigma that mobile home parks have. But to Kevin's point, most mobile home parks that are being developed today are more akin, thanks to manufactured housing, are more akin to housing communities, just like any other, they're just manufactured houses. So I, I think unfortunately that stigma though, of that rundown uh, trailer trash, for lack of a better word, is still there for a lot of people. Um, and for that reason, you're not seeing development of mobile home parks and therefore the supply is limited and it is one of those exciting asset classes. So I just kind of wanted to share that. Yeah, I think it, it's almost like we've got mobile home parks, then we've got the single family homes, right? And then we've got like affordable housing which I think is meant to be like kind of in the middle of those two. So I feel like he, he was kind of pointing towards like, yes, there's there's going to be continued more development into like affordable homes. They might not simply call them mobile home parks because maybe there's that stigma, but affordable housing, it, it, like, I don't know. I don't know the intricacies of all of that, but that that I feel like is where we're going is like more of that. But he's still saying it's still not fast enough. We've still got this affordable housing crisis that we have. So I think we're moving in that direction. I think that's good to have various different, you know, the ranges of price points, rent points, whatever it is for people to have affordable or whatever they, they can afford, uh, depending on income and things like that. So absolutely. Uh, I feel like that was a great podcast with him and super helpful for right. me. No, I know. Absolutely. Before we wrap up and send everybody off here today, just did want to let everybody know that if you are looking for a new CPA or CPA firm, uh, we are accepting clients for the 2023 tax year, as well as the 2024 tax year. So now is as good a time as ever to get that conversation started. If you are interested, you can head on over to www.therealestatecpa.com, click that big get started button, fill out a form, let us know some information about your situation, and we'll reach out to you with next steps about hopping on a call and discussing your situation further. Lastly, if you are a CPA or EA, you're a tax professional, you're listening to this, if you're looking to make a move, you're tired of the same old grind of a traditional accounting firm, we're hiring, we're hiring, we're always hiring, we're hiring advisors right now. So if you are looking to, to make a jump, head on over to www.therealestatecpa.com slash careers. We'd love to learn more about you, what you have going on. And if there's a fit, we'd love to bring you on board on the team. So again, check that out, therealestatecpa.com slash careers. But that's it for today. We'll catch everybody on next week's episode of the Tax Smart REI podcast. Hey, before we wrap up, I wanted to remind you about our other podcast, the Major League Real Estate Podcast for syndicators, fund managers, and large-scale operators. Brandon Hall and Dylan Brown dive deep into subjects, including finance, tax, market analysis, team dynamics, optimizing operations, leveraging cutting-edge technology, and a lot more. If you like the Tax Smart RAI podcast and you're a large-scale operator, you're going to love the Major League Real Estate Podcast. You can check it out on all major podcast platforms, including Apple and Spotify. Again, that's the Major League Real Estate Podcast, available now on Apple, Spotify, and wherever else podcasts can be found. And that's it for today. We'll catch you on next week's episode of the Tax Smart RAI Podcast.